our opening hymn is hymn 43, hymn 43. We sing the almighty power of God, who bade the mountains rise, who spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. We sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines too at his command, and all the stars obey. We sing the goodness of the Lord, who fills the earth with food, who formed his creatures by a word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed, where'er we turn our eyes, whene'er we view the ground we tread, or gaze upon the sky. There's not a plant nor flower below, but makes thy glories known, and clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. On thee each moment we depend, if thou withdraw, we die. O may we ne'er let God offend, who is forever nigh. Amen. Let us rise. You follow the order of service as found on page five. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto thee that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against thee by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore we plead for refuge to thine infinite mercy, seeking and imploring thy grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given thine only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins, and by thy Holy Spirit increase in us true knowledge of thee and of thy will and true obedience to thy word, to the end that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, hath had mercy upon us and hath given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgiveth us our sins. To them that believe on his name he giveth power to become the sons of God and hath promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. Our song for today is Psalm 138 found on page 973, we read together the 138th Psalm. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. When I called, you answered me. You made me bold and stout-hearted. May all the kings of the earth praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. May they sing the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is on high, he looks upon the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand you save me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hand. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, 
God the Father Almighty. O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord, thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you have given unto us all things that are connected with life and godliness through the glorious revelation of the gospel. We ask you, cause your word to dwell in us richly and fill us with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that we may know our sin and your son as the savior from sin and may live in a way that is worthy of the Lord, bearing fruit in every kind of good work and growing in the knowledge of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and governs with you and the Holy Ghost, one true God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson is found in the book of Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, beginning with the 12th verse. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your forefathers and loved them. He chose you, their descendants, above all the nations, as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the alien, giving him food and clothing. And you are to love those who are aliens, for you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. He is your praise, he is your God, who performed for you those great and awesome wonders you saw with your own eyes. Here ends the Old Testament lesson. Our epistle lesson is found in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the first chapter, beginning with the fourth verse. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. Here ends the epistle lesson. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel which is recorded in St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter, beginning with the 34th verse. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? 
the son of David, they replied. He said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Here ends the gospel. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our next hymn is 386. Hymn 386. My Savior sinners doth receive, who find no rest and no salvation, to whom no man can comfort give, so great their guilt and condemnation. For whom the world is all too small, their sins both them and God appall, with whom the law itself hath broken, on whom judgment hath been spoken. To them the gospel hope doth give, my Savior sinners doth receive, my Savior sinners doth receive. A love more deep than mother love, with which his heart was overflowing, drew him to earth from heaven above, on sinners boundless grace bestowing. He in their stead a curse became. He bore the cross with all its shame, brought full atonement by his suffering, and gave up his life for them an offering. This comfort doth the gospel give. My Savior sinners doth receive. My Savior sinners doth receive. His loving bosom still remains, a haven for the heavy laden. Christ frees them from their guilty stains, their burdened hearts doth ease and gladden. He casts into the unfathomed sea the load of their iniquity. He gives assurance by his spirit that they are saved through his own merit. Yea, they shall live with believe. My Savior sinners doth receive. My Savior sinners doth receive. Say not my sins are far too great, his mercy I have scorned and slighted. Now my repentance is too late. I can now with his love invite. O trembling sinner, have no fear. In penitence to Christ draw near. Come now, though conscience still is chiding. Accept his mercy, e'er abiding. Come, blessed are they who this believe. My Savior sinners doth receive. My Savior sinners doth receive. O draw us ever unto thee, thou friend of sinners, gracious Savior. Help us that we may fervently desire thy pardon, peace, and favor. When guilty conscience doth reprove, reveal to us thy heart of love. May we our wretchedness beholding, see then thy pardoning grace unfolding, and say to God all glory be, my Savior Christ receiveth me. Amen. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is found in the book of Nahum, the first chapter, beginning with the second verse. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. 
His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the blossoms of Lebanon fail. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can stand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in time of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. This is our text. Dear fellow reading, When I first looked at this text a week ago, I thought to myself, what am I going to do with it? There are some very harsh words here. For example, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. The mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. Who can withstand his indignation, who can endure his fierce anger. And yet, our text also says the Lord is good. And since this is God's word, I'm supposed to preach the whole counsel of God. The challenge then is to properly present law and gospel to correctly handle the word of truth. This leads me to a question. How should we describe the Lord our God? And how this question is answered depends upon who you ask. If we ask the atheist this question, he would probably answer that's a silly question because there is no, no God. I wouldn't recommend this position to anybody, let alone the atheist, especially on Judgment Day, He's going to be in for a terrible surprise. How should we describe God? The agnostic might say, I don't know how to describe God, and there is no way for me to know. And in the end, he will suffer the same fate as the atheist in Judgment Day. If we ask the philosopher this question, some would describe God as a kind of grandfather who, who winks a little at a little wrongdoing. To those who want to think this way, I would ask them to read our text and read it a second time and think about it for a while. Some of the other thinkers might see two kinds of passages in Scripture. One kind of like the first verse of our text, the Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. And the other kind of passage, like the one is probably the most famous in Scripture, God so loved the world that he gave us one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so they look at these two, and it's like, well, it can't be both in any reason. And so they, they, they pick the one they like the best, God is love. And then they tend to ignore or downplay that God is just. You and I recognize that both love and justice describe the Lord our God, and so they really not are in conflict. And I'll get to that point a little bit more later. And there are people who wonder if God is unfair. The psalmist Asaph wondered about this question. And so I'm going to read a few select verses from Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. In vain I have washed my hands in innocence. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. 
When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. The psalmist wrestled with the question of unfairness until he looked at the matter with an eternal perspective in mind. And he concluded that trust in God is never wrong, for it's that trust in God that leads to eternal life. How should we describe God? I've given you five different examples, and they all flowed out of human reason. And when it comes to describing God, human reason can never answer that question completely correctly. In fact, our sinful nature describes God as an angry judge and a bully who pushes people around. Someone in a somewhat tongue-in-cheek way tried to sum this human viewpoint up when he said God so rules and makes rules so that things are either illegal, immoral, or fattening. Obviously, our reason cannot correctly describe God. Fortunately, God's children have something better. We have God's revelation of himself on the page of the scripture that gives us a really comforting answer to the question, how should we describe God? And I think the text before us is a good help in answering the question. Our text simply says, the Lord is good. Taking into consideration the whole text, we can say this. The great beauty of God is shown in his goodness to his people. We see his goodness in this. One, the Lord is slow to anger. Two, the Lord will certainly not let the guilty go unpunished. And three, the Lord cares for those who trust in him. The book of Nahum is an oracle addressed to Nineveh the capital of Assyria. And, and that background is important for understanding what's going on. About a hundred years before the prophet Nahum delivered this message, God sent Jonah to preach repentance to Nineveh and the king and the people humbled themselves before the Lord and God spared them. But now, a hundred years later, Nineveh is wicked and cruel it's conquering the nations around them and doing so in a very cruel way. Nineveh is becoming a threat to Judah and Jerusalem and if Judah and Jerusalem are destroyed then God's promise is in jeopardy. And so we have in Nahum both harsh words for the wicked and comfort for God's people. Nahum clearly says the Lord is slow to anger. We should remember the Lord is not the cause of evil. We also remember that sin angers the Lord. And yet God desires that sinners repent and turn to the Lord and turn away from evil. The Lord is good because he is slow to anger. And that's a very comforting thought for us sinners. Slow to anger does not mean God overlooks sin. But rather, it means he gives people time to repent. For you and me and our fellow Christians, repentance is a daily exercise. Daily we confess our sins. And daily we look to the Lord for the forgiveness of sins. We have the forgiveness of sins because of Jesus. And for the wicked, God is also slow to anger so that they have time are given time, if you will, to, to learn about sin and grace and turn to the Lord. It's unfortunate that many people of this world squander their time of grace, never learning to know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. 
The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Slow to anger does not mean that the Lord sets aside his power or his justice. The Lord punishes the guilty, if you will. He does not leave the guilty unpunished. This is certainly a strong way of preaching God's law. Now, Scripture both says the Lord forgives and does not forgive sin. This may seem like a contradiction, at least to our human reason. And this so-called seeming contradiction is found throughout Scripture. When Moses asked to see God, the Lord said, this cannot be done. But the Lord did proclaim his name to Moses. And this is what the Lord said to Moses. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to the thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. This passage clearly sets beside God forgives and God does not leave the guilty unpunished. The words of Nahum, I believe, are echoing this passage from Moses. Clearly the Lord both forgives and does not forgive, does not leave the guilty unpunished. And this is not a situation where we look at them and say, okay, it can't be both, so... We reason, we've got to pick one, and we'll, we'll pick the one and downplay the other. The only place this seeming contradiction is completely resolved is on the cross of Jesus. Sin requires payment. And the many Old Testament sacrifices were designed to teach the people that without the payment, there is no forgiveness of sin. It required a blood payment. The soul that sins is supposed to die, Scripture says. And we already confess that we are sinners. And that is also saying that, that you and I deserve the death penalty. But God found a way to pay for sin and at the same time spare you and me the consequences of our sin. He did this for you and me and the entire world. When Jesus went the way of the cross, God laid on him our sin, the sins of the entire world, and he made the payment in our place. And because Jesus paid for you and me, you and I have the forgiveness of sin and heaven to look forward to. The Lord prepared this salvation for all people. But not all people know about Jesus. And there are people who knowingly reject Jesus. And those people and the nations they belong to often reject Christ and his offer. And because of that, they are involved in wicked behavior. So what's God supposed to do with this wickedness? Yes, we just read he's slow to anger. But he's not powerless. And he does act when his patience runs out. The harsh words to Nineveh reveal what happens when God's patience does indeed come to an end. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. Well, we are not to do something to get even when we feel we've been wronged. The Lord himself has the power and the authority 
to take vengeance. Add to this that he is described here also as a jealous God. And jealous means that God actively protects what belongs to him. And since all glory and honor belong to God, when people give glory and honor to false gods, the Lord is indeed jealous. He comes angry because something that belongs to him was given to another. The bulk of our text reads this way. The Lord is jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are shattered and before him. And as I looked at this, there were many phrases in there that reminded me of Bible history. For example, the phrase, he rebukes the sea. I'm reminded by those words of what took place when God divided the Red Sea. It was a demonstration of God's power, certainly. And in that demonstration of power, he did two things. He delivered his people and at the same time destroyed his enemy. He makes the rivers run dry. And these words remind me of the Lord stopping the waters on the Jordan River so that Joshua and his army could cross the Jordan and begin conquering the promised land. And I recall that this was done when the river was at flood stage, not at the time of the year when the river was running low, certainly a demonstration of God's power. The mountains quaking remind me of when the Lord descended on Mount Sinai and spoke the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel. No wonder Nahum writes, who can endure his fierce anger. We are living at a time when respect for those in authority is often very low. In the late 40s, a doctor by the name of Benjamin Spock advocated a more relaxed approach to parenting. I didn't find the quote, so I, but I think he even said something along the lines that spanking a child was not necessary. And today, our country is reaping the fruits of such relaxed attitude towards discipline. There were times when I was a child, I needed an attitude adjustment. And I had parents who found a way to to adjust my attitude. And... uh, Mom took care of discipline when dad was out in the fields. All she had to say was, wait till dad gets home. And I understood what respect for authority meant with those words. I'm glad my parents did that for me. And the Lord does the same with not only individuals, but with nations. Pharaoh made fun of the God of Moses. And Pharaoh found out what the Lord can do. Goliath cursed the God of David, but he didn't do it for long, did he? The Lord has strong threats and judgments here. And he has the power to carry out his threats and judgment. And those strong words are designed to serve God's good purpose. And that includes leading people to repentance and turning to the Lord. The Lord is good, 
a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. It may seem at times as we live in this world that God's people have little influence. It may even seem that at times we are barely noticed by the rest of the world. Perhaps that the world has little regard for us Christians. So let me read this again. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Compared to the rest of the text, it's just a few lines, but oh, how beautiful and comforting they are. The Lord is our refuge and hiding place. He is the good shepherd who cares for us, body and soul. Today, Nahum places side by side the Lord's anger and his goodness. And his anger in no way sets aside his goodness, and his good goodness in no way sets aside his anger. The Lord's goodness is seen in his being slow to anger, in his destruction of the, of the wicked, and in his care for all those who trust in him. Amen. The peace of God that surpasses all our understanding shall keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us rise for prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, this world is brimming over with iniquity. Satan, our arch enemy, is getting bolder in his attacks upon Christianity. The depravity of mankind is almost beyond belief. Love grows cold as greed and selfishness flourish in men's hearts. The nations of earth have set themselves against you. On every hand are those who despise what you regard as holy and delight to do those things we know to be evil. Waves of crime and violence in our streets have become commonplace. Family and home have broken down as marriage vows, once spoken in earnest, are tossed aside. Children are no longer taught to be obedient and respectful. People trust their own knowledge and have fashioned God in their own image. They are self-righteous and proud. The church on earth, too, is beset by enemies within and without. Many false teachers have invaded the church, seducing the unwary, causing divisions and offenses. And there is a serious lack of dedication and understanding on the part of professing Christians. The danger is very real that we could lose the faith which was once delivered to the saints. As we stand in this world doomed to destruction, comfort us with the knowledge that you have loved us with an everlasting love. Fill us with the knowledge and peace that comes from knowing we have God's full forgiveness because of the sacrifice you made for our sins. Comfort our sagging spirits with your promise of everlasting life. By the Spirit, strengthen our faith through word and sacrament. Make us watchful each day for your reappearing in glory to deliver us from this present evil world. Do not let the growing darkness of ungodliness put out the light of knowledge you have given us by faith. May we never grow weary of resisting sin or of doing good, knowing this is our reasonable service of love to you who first loved us. Preserve our faith that we may finally wear the crown of glory. Enable each of us to be a source of strength and courage to others. Draw our hearts to you so that we remain in constant touch with you through prayer. Oh, let none be lost who now call on your name. In your mercy, bring many others to confess their sins and to accept you by faith in their Savior and Lord. Dear Jesus, pardon our many offenses and rid us of any doubts we may have about your love for us. Through your grace, inspire us to live each day filled with faith and godliness, so that the world may, be see, may see you in us. According to your promise, come quickly. We also join in the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with our next hymn, which is hymn 657. Beautiful Savior, King of creation, Son of God and Son of man, truly I love thee, truly I serve thee, light of my soul, my joy, my crown. Fair are the meadows, fair are the woodlands, robed in flowers of blooming spring. Jesus is fairer, Jesus is purer, he makes our sorrowing spirits sing. Fair is the sunshine, Fair is the moonlight, bright the sparkling stars on high. Jesus shines brighter, Jesus shines purer than all the angels in the sky. Beautiful Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God and Son of Man, glory and honor, praise, adoration, now and forevermore be thine. Amen. Let us rise. Grant, we beseech you, Almighty God, unto your church, your Holy Spirit, and the wisdom which comes down from above, that your word as becomes it may not be bound, but have free course and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast fast faith we may serve you, and in the confession of your name abide unto the end. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Ghost, one true God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our last hymn is 680. The first four verses and the last verse. That should be 580, shouldn't it? Uh, Typo. 580, 1 through 4 and verse 9. To thee, our God, we fly for mercy and for grace. O hear our lowly cry and hide not thou thy face. O Lord, stretch forth thy mighty hand and guard and bless our fatherland. Arise, O Lord of hosts, be jealous for thy name and drive out from our coasts the sins that put to shame. O Lord, stretch forth thy mighty hand and guard and bless our fatherland. Thy best gifts from on high in rich abundance pour that we may magnify and praise thee more and more. O Lord, stretch forth thy mighty hand and guard and bless our fatherland. The powers ordained by thee with heavenly wisdom bless. May they thy servants be and rule in righteousness. O Lord, stretch forth thy mighty hand and guard and bless our fatherland. Though vile and worthless still, thy people, Lord, are we. And for our God we will none other have but thee. O Lord, stretch forth thy mighty hand and guard and bless our fatherland. Amen. 